All right. Well, welcome to the uh, common mistakes that investors make in the stock market. Investors and traders make in the stock market. I'm Tyler Ballhorn, founder of StockScores.com. A little background on me. I've traded the stock market for over 30 years and I've taught people how to do what I do for over 20. And in this webinar, I'm going to walk you through some of the common mistakes that we all make. And I include myself in this. The reason I am an expert on some of these things is because I've made all of these mistakes at one time or another, but I've also learned how to overcome them. So today is not only about the problem, but also about the solution. And these mistakes everyone makes, and it is really what holds people back from being successful in the market. When I say successful, I mean beating the market. That's our goal is to not earn what the market earns. If the market averages a return of 8% a year, if we just want to earn 8% a year, just go buy an index ETF. You're going to get close to that. However, if you want to beat the market and small investors have a greater ability to beat the market simply because they don't have to place so much capital at work like an institutional investor would. So if you want to beat the market, you have to not only know a strategy and the rules for entry and exit and all that kind of stuff, but more importantly, you need to have, know how to overcome yourself. And that's what this uh, video is all about. So let's get right into it. Are you normal? Normal human beings are predisposed to fail in the stock market. Now, if you've been around my work for the last many years, you will know that I say this over and over again. You are the enemy. You are the risk in the stock market. The stock market doesn't care about you. It's not out to hurt you. It's not out to help you. It's simply a vehicle to extract returns if you know what you're doing. And knowing what you're doing doesn't take a lot of work. It's not like going to law school or medical school. The rules for my strategies, I can write on the back of a napkin. But following those rules, overcoming yourself, that is where the challenge lies. And I've taught in the last 20 years, many, many people, and this is always the last hurdle that people face. So if you've been in the market for many years, or if you're brand new to the market, you will probably recognize some of these things and go, oh yeah, I do that. And that's what uh, we're gonna try to overcome. So emotion is the enemy. To do well as an investor or as a trader, you have to overcome yourself. And it doesn't matter if you're a day trader, a swing trader, a long-term investor that does five transactions in the market a year. These themes are common to everyone. And we're gonna go through, I think five or six of them, one at a time. I'll sort of present the problem and then I'll talk a little bit about the solution. And then at the end, we'll take some questions about trading in general, investing in general, but also if you have some stock questions, I'll review some charts for you and give them a score. So if you want to know what I think of Tesla, I'll walk you through the analysis and give it a score and whether it's a hold, a buy, a sell, that sort of thing. Okay, and we'll do four or five stocks at the end. All right, so first thing, and of course, I'm doing this uh, webinar on April Fool's Day, so I built the theme around being foolish. And I don't actually think that we're all foolish. We're just normal. But one of the mistakes that foolish investors make is they use public information. Stocks make big price moves when the fundamentals get better or worse. So if a biotech company is researching a treatment for some disease and the research finds that their treatment is working well, what they've really found is that their ability to make money on that treatment has gone up. You know, some of these drugs can be worth billions of dollars a year. And so as the market learns of new information about that biotech company and about the treatment that they're developing, you'll see that stock go up. By the same token, if that biotech company seeks FDA approval and fails to get it, then the company's ability to make money off of that drug goes down dramatically. And you'll see that stock drop significantly. So we know then that the fundamentals drive price moves. And I should say it's the perception of fundamentals that drive price moves because how we judge information as human beings is largely dependent upon our mood. 
And so we have to recognize that investors are sometimes foolish in general, but these stocks that they like can still make significant moves higher. You see that in pump and dump stock promotions. You see that in stocks that are hot or markets that are hot. They go up long after it makes sense because the perception of fundamentals is positive. So we have to make that distinction. It's not just about fundamentals, it's how fundamentals are interpreted through the emotions of the market. Now, stocks ultimately move on private information first. There's no secrets in the stock market. I'm gonna show you some examples in a moment where a stock moved well ahead of having a good earnings announcement. And that's because there's all these people in the market that do great research, that uncover information that is not widely known. You know, there's large institutional investors that will pay people to sit on a bench outside of a store and count traffic, count how many people are moving in and out and watch what their average purchase is. And then they can, from that, derive what earnings are likely to be. Now, you and I probably won't do that. We can't do that. We don't have the resources. But when these large institutional investors do work like that, they can predict the future. And in, when they have some information that is um, maybe not widely known yet, they will buy the market or sell the market and create abnormal activity that people like me, and perhaps one day you, will use to make decisions. But I wanna state very clearly that publicly available information is already priced into the stock. As soon as the uh, market learns of strong earnings in a news release, that information has no value anymore because the stock will go up or down to reflect that new information. And so once something is public, once you read about it in the Wall Street Journal or watch it on CNBC or read it in the news release, doesn't matter how good or bad it is, it's priced into the stock. The stock moves on the future, not on the present. It predicts the future. And again, I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a moment. Now, some will then scratch their heads and say, well, if the only way to do well in the market is to have inside information or private information, then what hope is there for me? Well, the beauty of it is, the people that have better information leave a trail for us to follow. And if you have some simple tools and methods, you can figure out what the well-informed money is doing. So let's jump into stockscores.com, which is my website. We're gonna pull up here, Lulu. And I'm gonna show you a one month, uh, 30, 60 minute chart of this stock. Now on Wednesday, the company announced very strong earnings, beat expectations by a wide margin. But that information that was public there actually started being priced in <coughs> over a week prior, right here. You see this really tall candle? So for those of you who aren't familiar with stock charts, you have price along the right and time along the bottom. Each one of these bars on this chart is a 60 minute bar. Sometimes you look at weekly charts, daily charts, one minute charts, just depends on the style of trading you are doing. If you're a swing trader, then I would tend to look at a 30 minute, a 15 minute, maybe a 60 minute chart. <clears throat> In this case, Lulu made a statistically significant abnormal price gain. So when I say statistically significant, what I mean by that is the price gain was beyond what we would expect 95 times out of 100. In, in other words, it only happens 5% of the time. And that tells us that there's something going on. So there was abnormal buying in this stock where I've drawn that circle, all right? And that abnormal buying was likely caused by one of those large institutional investors who either did good work or heard a rumor and they went into the market and they bought aggressively and the stock moved up in anticipation of the earnings announcement. Now, I don't know anything about Lulu, except that they make yoga pants and 
things like that. But my algorithms that I've developed to look for abnormality found that stock on that day. And then lo and behold, five days later, the big jump on earnings. So our first lesson is to not wait for public information, which came out here, but to look for evidence that people are trading on private information that ultimately can't be explained. Now, it's not that simple. I will tell you that all stocks that do well in the market start their big market moves with abnormal activity. However, not all abnormal activity leads to big market moves. We have to have a way to filter out the good abnormal activity from that which is not significant. So in this case, this stock was breaking a downward trend line from a rising bottom with abnormal activity, and it did it twice. Did it once there, and then another time there. So if we take the first one at around $300, a week later, you're at almost 370. So that's a significant, better than 20% move in a week without knowing anything about the company's earnings, without knowing anything more than they have stores and malls that sell yoga pants. Okay, let me show you another example. PYXS is a stock that uh, we day traded this past week, past month really, it's been hot for a while but I'm gonna zoom in on this and we're gonna do the same sort of thinking. Look for surprise abnormal activity as a clue that something is going on. And this time, we also see volume spiking. So on the 27th of March, you had abnormal volume and abnormal price that surprised the market. Before that, the stock was boring. And then it came alive with abnormal activity right here and then it gave a confirming signal with a secondary break the following day on the 28th. Now that was at about $3. And three days later, the stock had hit 650. That's greater than 100% return simply by following abnormal activity. Now, I'm doing other webinars this week, doing one on Tuesday that's all about investing doing one on Wednesday that's all about day trading. And I'll get deeper into the methodology for those types of trading and investing in those webinars. Today's more about the human side, and then we'll get into how we actually find these things and pick them and that sort of thing in the webinars Tuesday and Wednesday. So make sure you're registered for those. I'll show you at the end of the uh, webinar today how to do that, okay? So that's the lesson of not using public information because it's useless. It's already priced into the stock. We want to use private information. Now, the next foolish thing that investors do is fight the current. Most stocks, most of the time, are correlated to the overall market. So if the market is in a downward trend, most stocks will be in a downward trend. If the market's in an upward trend, most stocks will be in an upward trend. And there's many people who get into the market when the market's in an upward trend and they think they know what they're doing. They think they're smart because they're successful with their trades and investments. And then inevitably the market turns lower again and they give back all of their profits. And their sense of confidence and, and knowing what drives the market is shattered because they really didn't know what they were doing. They just got lucky. A monkey can make money in an up market by throwing darts at a board. So to beat the market, you have to understand how to trade uptrends and downtrends. Now you can either trade with the trend by buying in an upward trend or short selling in a downward trend, or you can do something in a downward market called trading alpha, where you're trading stocks that are behaving abnormally trading on their own story. So what is an alpha stock? Well, let's go back to our biotech company example. Let's say the whole biotech sector is generally moving lower and it has done so through most of 2022. But if one biotech company has a treatment for cancer and the initial testing of their drug or treatment is successful, it doesn't matter that that market is going down, that stock will go up because something specific to that company is positive. 
And that allows that stock to do really well, even in a down market. Now, alpha stocks leave clues. The most important footprint for an alpha stock is abnormal volume. If the stock is trading with abnormal volume, it's often because there's something significant going on. And when we looked at that last stock, PYXS, I'll just jump back to it. See how there's abnormal volume there? This is an oncology company. So it's a biotech company, I would assume. I don't know anything, but just judge them by the name. They have something to do with cancer treatment. So in a market where biotech in general wasn't doing that great last week, this stock did extremely well because it is an alpha stock. And so one of the key things you want to do is not fight the market trend. But if you are going to fight the market trend, you have to do so by trading alpha stocks. So how do you know what the state of the market is? Very simple. We just pull up a chart of the S&P 500 ETF, which is SPY. If there's rising bottoms on the chart, the buyers are in control. If there's falling tops on the chart, the sellers are in control. This particular chart of the S&P has rising bottoms and falling tops, so this is a neutral market. Until it can break out of this pattern, which is called a pennant pattern, it is a neutral market. Now, you can have markets that are neutral in one time frame, but bullish or positive in another and bearish in another, just by looking at different time frames. So if you are a position trader, if you hold stocks for weeks or months, then the daily time frame is important. If you're a longer term investor, then the weekly time frame is important. So I can go to a three year chart of the S&P and I can see that from early 2020 into early 2022, the buyers were in control simply because the bottoms were rising on the chart. And then in early 2022, the sellers took control. They broke the upward trend line. And now you had falling tops over the next year. Now, in the last six months, we have stabilized. We have started to build some rising bottoms, but we're still stuck in this sideways range. So that's why I said the market is neutral now. It was bearish here. And here it was bullish. Here, it's really easy to make money being a buyer. Here, it's really easy to make money being a short seller or buying inverse ETFs. And in a sideways market, it's tough to be either side unless you're focused on alpha stocks, those stocks that do well because they're trading on their own story and they have some. Uh, evidence of alpha, which is that abnormal volume. Next foolish thing that we do is we wait for proof. Human beings like to see proof before they jump. And in the stock market, that means they wait for the stock to go up. Now think about maybe a time that someone told you to buy a stock. You're at a coffee shop. Someone 10 years ago said, you should buy this company that makes electric cars called Tesla. And you say, electric cars, they don't work. Golf carts are electric, they hardly even work. Why would I wanna buy a company that makes electric cars? It seems foolish. And then a few months later, that same friend says, hey, did you buy Tesla? It's up 30% since I told you. And you go, what? Up 30% since you told me. No, I, I didn't buy it. That's ah, probably gone up too much. It sounds like a pump and dump. I'm going to ignore it. And then another six months later, your friend says, hey, did you buy Tesla? It's up 120% since I told you. Well, now you're interested because now there's proof. Your friend was right, but you didn't believe them in the beginning because you didn't see proof. The only proof you need is in the stock chart. All that you need to do is look at the chart and say who is in control and is control changing? See, most people do not want to lead the crowd. In the market, this is a mistake. You have to be part of the group that gets in early, but you don't want to be going against the crowd either. So you need to understand the 
chart pattern that tells us who is in control. And we don't want to chase strength. We want to buy weakness in strong stocks. So let's look at a couple of examples again. Go back to stock scores, t.iag. So, whoops. There we go. Okay, I'm going to make this a one-year chart. So think back to what we just talked about, who's in control of the market. If the tops are falling, the sellers are in control. We want to look for situations where the downward trend line is broken and there's a rising bottom. So there's the low and here is a higher low. And if I draw a line across those tops, I have a trend line and I broke the downward trend line from a rising bottom. So that was the cue to consider buying the stock. And I assure you that the news that you would have heard about, the general chatter on the internet at that time, would have been quite negative because human beings react generally, they don't predict, and they would have reacted to the fact that this stock has been going down for many months. And then it's only here when that cycle was broken, but most people won't pay attention to this stock until up here when it's already gone up a lot. Don't do that. Don't chase strength because you have a fear of missing out. Let's take a look at Tesla. And we're going to go on a five-year weekly chart. Okay, nobody cares about the stock here. <laughs> it went up, it pulled back. Remember I just said you want to buy stocks that are strong when they're weak? You want to buy things on sale? So this stock is in an upward trend here, has a little bit of weakness, and then breaks the pullback. That would be an opportunity to buy. Now, an important rule to understand is never buy a stock when it's run away from its trend line. So what I've just drawn is a trend line and I've just cut it across these bottoms here and I've extended it out. When people get really excited, when the market gets euphoric, price will run away from the trend line. This is the worst time to be a buyer, but yet it is the time when the most people will buy because they have the most proof from what's happening in the market. The market is confirming that there's something good because every day the stock goes up. It's called the law of upticks. When the market is ticking higher, people believe. When the market's ticking down, or down, they think everything is bad. Well, here the market is moving down, but it's simply coming back to the upward trend line, and then it breaks the upward trend line, or sorry, breaks the pullback off of the upward trend line, and it starts again. And it goes from 240 to 400. Remember, this is a weekly chart, so it's quite long term. But eventually, this upward trend line is broken from a falling top here and again here. And now the party's over. Now Tesla's into a downward trend. And in the same way, when price runs away from the trend line, it usually comes back up to it, runs away from the trend line, and now it's coming back up to it. So if you're a short-term trader, you can trade from here to here or from here to here. But you always want to be aware of what the next wave is going to be. And if you judge it based on the last wave, based on the current wave, I guess, if you're looking for the proof, you're always going to be chasing your tail. All right, next example or next foolish thing that we do is we take too much risk. Emotion, <clears throat> pardon me, emotion is the enemy of every trader. It causes people to make bad decisions because their rational thoughts are replaced by the fight, flight or fight response. So what's really, really essential is to not take too much risk on the trades you take. Let's say you bought Tesla and it's not working. And you bought a lot of it because you see the cars everywhere. You have all these people saying great things. Elon Musk is a genius. So you buy as much as you can. But you buy when the stock has gone up a lot already. And so you're into that stock at one of those bad times when the 
price has run away from the trend. Then the stock starts to go down and now you're faced with a big loss, bigger than you can stomach. You're losing sleep at night. Are you going to sell? Are you going to say to yourself, yep, the market proved that I was wrong and I'm going to sell. I bought at 380. Now it's at 300. I'm not going to sell. I'm going to wait for it to turn around because after all, Elon Musk is a genius and this stock has been so strong. It was at 400 not that long ago. I'm going to wait for it to get back to 400. And it starts to go up again and you say, yeah, see, I did the right thing. Except that it never gets back to 400. And it starts to roll over again and go down and you're faced with a loss again and a bigger loss and a bigger loss. And so you stick with it because you can't stomach the size of the loss because you took too much risk. You know, if you were willing to lose a thousand dollars on a trade, but now you're faced with a $10,000 loss, you're probably not going to sell. And there are countless people in the market that have stocks in their portfolio that are down huge that they never sold because they didn't want to lock in the pain. There's a simple answer for this. You have to be a good loser. Fools aren't good losers. Good traders are good losers. And that sounds totally counterintuitive, but losing is part of investing and of trading. We are never going to be right all of the time. And therefore, we must control the size of the loss when we are wrong. And that means being a good loser is essential. So let's take a look at another chart and I'll show you how to do this. We're going to pull up a chart of Bombardier, which is a Canadian company. Had a really good run despite a weak market. So this is an alpha stock. It's been able to do well despite a bad market. And there was a, there's a few buy points on here, but let's use the very first one, which came when the downward trend line was broken from a rising bottom right here. Okay, that entry price was, just for sake of simplicity, $27. Now, what I want you to do is always plan to lose. So if I buy that stock at 27, I'm going to plan to lose with a stop loss. Now, lots of people have heard of stop loss ideas. It's far and away the um, most incorrectly done thing in, in trading. So many people don't use a stop properly. They'll say, okay, if the stock goes down 10%, I'm going to sell. If the stock, if I'm down $500, I'm going to sell. Wrong. You have to put your stops at the right place. And the way to do that is by looking at the last point where the stock stopped going down and started going up. That represents the opinion of the market. The market said, we don't think that this stock is worth less than $20 based on all of the fundamental information we have. Okay, so you're breaking your downward trend line from a rising bottom and you're going to buy at 27 and you're gonna to plan to lose at just under 20 because you always go just below emotional barriers. So we'll say 1995. So your risk per share, let's round it off, is $7 per share. That means if you buy 100 shares, your risk is $700. Are you okay with losing $700 on a trade? Well, for some who have more capital, they would say, yeah, it's no big deal. For someone who has you know, $10,000 to trade with, it's more relative to their capital base. It may not sit well with them. It may be too much risk. Okay, then buy less. And you have to buy the amount that you're comfortable with. Your risk tolerance has to be considered because if not, if it falls down through that floor, which in this case it never did, you're not going to take the loss. You're going to ride it out no matter how far down it goes. So make sure that you are a good loser. Every time you take a trade, plan to lose. If we go back to Tesla, and let's say you bought this little break of a pullback. By the way, it's not good because there was no rising bottom. Let's say you did. 
you're buying at 300 and your stop is at 260 so your risk per share is $40 so if you buy three shares it costs you $900 and your risk is $120 if you're okay with that then you take it but when it does this when it breaks down through your stop loss point you have to sell because look what happened it kept going down 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 went all the way down to $100 so now you're $120 loss has turned into a, I don't know, $500 loss? I have to calculate it, but it's bigger than what was planned, right? So it is so important to make sure that you be a good loser. All right. Next one, fools don't have a plan. Now, would you build a house without a plan? Would you start a business without a plan? Most people will say no to those things, but most people approach the stock market without a plan. What are your rules for entry? Have you tested them? Do they work? How about your rules for exit? Risk management. How many shares are you buying? I just went through an example of how to calculate that. You can get more sophisticated than that. What's your analytical process? What are the steps you take to identify opportunities? What are the tools that you use? What kind of post-trade analysis do you do? These should all be part of your plan. And if you don't have one, then you're just in the dark. Now, ultimately, you should trade a proven strategy that has been tested through different market conditions. I teach people my strategies. They're well tested. Been using them and developing them for 30 years. You don't have to use mine. You can develop your own, but just recognize it's a very time-consuming process because you have to test it, test it, test it without bias and make sure it works in a good market, in a bad market, or if it only works in a good market, then only do it in a good market. Only do it when the market is trending higher and then have another strategy for when the market is trending lower. So that's the kind of work that you must do, whether you're a long-term investor doing five trades a year for your retirement portfolio, or whether you're a day trader, doing five trades a day to make income and make your living doing that from your home. You can do both of them, but you have to have a strategy. You have to have a plan. And they actually aren't going to be that different. You know, the things I do as a day trader are very similar to the things that I do as an investor. It's just different time frame, but the methodology is largely the same. And that's what I will get into on Tuesday with investing, on Wednesday with day trading, in these webinars that we're doing. I'll show you how to register for those in just a moment. Okay, here they are, upcoming webinars. How to invest in the stock market profitably, Tuesday, April 4th, 6 p.m. Pacific. Day trading is on Wednesday. And then more information on how you can learn my strategies, how you can use my tools. I will show you that on Thursday in the evening as well. To register, just go to stockscores.com. Go to upcoming events under trader training. And you can register there. All right. All free, about an hour long. And we're going to go into some of the more uh, greater detail on how you find things, how you do the trade. So if, if you want to dive a little deeper in what we've talked about today, those uh, will be helpful. All right. Now, before I take some stock questions, I'll just talk a little bit about the trainer and investor training that I have coming up in April. I'll talk more about this next week, but just very quickly. I have strategies for investing, for trading, day trading, swing trading. I've built my own tools, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building tools, which is the Stock Scores website. I have tools for a program called TradeStation. I have a lot of knowledge, done this for 30 years. I've trained people for over 20. And uh, I provide my support to my students as you work through the learn learning process. So next week, those webinars will go more into that. I've also got a special discount code for my trader training courses coming up in April. And so you'll have to join me on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday for that discount code. What I'll do now is I will um, just put up this poll. Would you like a follow-up? I'm not a pushy marketer. I just, I don't like it myself, so I don't do it to other people. So if you would like a follow-up email um, in the next week, with more detail about my trader training courses, where your interest is. Are you interested in investing and in day trading? I have a mentorship course coming up. 
And again, I'll give more details about these things later in the week, but if you want a follow-up email, just say yes. If you don't, I won't bug you. And, and it will also give you that discount code for those that might want to purchase one of these things. Uh, you get a pretty healthy discount until the middle of April. Okay, so I'll leave that up for another 20 seconds or so. Now, if you're watching this video uh, as a video, sorry, if you're watching the webinar as a video and you don't get a chance to get on the poll list, just make sure you check into the webinars later this week because I'll, I'll put this up again then and you can uh, put in your choice there as well if you want that discount code. Okay, next up, we're going to do some stock questions. I've had some people already type in some questions, and so I will do that in just a moment. I'm going to take this poll down in about 10 seconds. All right, so let's take this down, and let's jump back to the stock score site and punch in some symbols. So we're going to take a look at NVIDIA. Now, the answer to a question whether this is a good or bad stock depends a lot on your time frame. So, you know, I would judge it very differently as a day trade than I would as an investment. So I'm going to assume that all of these are sort of longer term questions. Is this a stock to hold in your portfolio? That sort of thing. On NVIDIA, who's in control? Buyers are in control, right? It's been going up for a while. It broke a pullback back here from a rising bottom. So that was a time to buy at 160. As of right now, it's a hold. I would not buy it here. But if you're in it, I would hold it. I'm just going to take a look at the three-year weekly chart. Yeah, it's coming up to a little bit of resistance there. So you may see it stall in the short term. And ultimately, it should get up to its old highs. It's doing quite well. But right now, it's a little bit overextended. There's your upward trend line. And so it's quite far above that. So it would be quite reasonable for the stock to come back to that, bounce off of it, and then move up again. So for now, it's a hold. And I would be a seller of the stock if it breaks this upward trend line. So draw a line across these bottoms. If it makes a falling top and then breaks the upward trend line, I would sell. Otherwise, it's a hold. Okay, next up, uh, T.AQN. All right, so this is a stock that was actually a decent trader last week. Here's your downward trend line. That's been broken. And it broke two weeks ago from a rising bottom. See how these bottoms have been rising? So the momentum has turned. Now, you'll notice up in the top right here is the stock score. It's 73 right now. That's a bullish score. Look at where the scores were as the stock was moving lower. They were always below 60. And it only got above 60 right about there. So that's when this chart started to improve. When I developed this stock score indicator, what I did essentially is take these concepts that I've talked about today, rising bottoms, trend lines, abnormal activity, that sort of thing, and I put a scoring model to it. So when this stock broke out right here, see there's volume, there's a spike in the stock score. The green line is above 60, the blue line spiked up above 80, so that was actually a good time to buy at $11. Now it's at 11.50, I still think it looks pretty good, worth considering. I'm going to take a look at it just on a little bit longer term time frame. And here you see it's still really fighting a long term downward trend. So I think it may come up for a while. And if you're in it, I would hold. But I don't expect that it's going to be like the hottest stock of the year. It's going to take a little bit of time to reverse the momentum. So good hold, maybe consider as a buy. I'd give it a six out of 10 as a buy. All right. How about Toronto Dominion Bank TD? Okay. What's happened to TD? absolutely pummeled because of the U.S. banking crisis, upward trend line broken. It has broken the downward trend line five days ago, but not from a rising bottom. So what it should do is pull back, build a rising bottom, and then break this downward trend line. If it can do that, I would be a buyer of the stock. Until then, I would avoid it. Again, as an investor. Now, as a day trader or a swing trader, let's say, I can go to the 10 day chart, it's very different. On the 10 day chart, there was a buy point right here because it broke from a pattern called the cup and handle pattern. But again, as, a, as an investor longer term, I don't see any trade on. All right, uh, what are your thoughts on Sonova CVE and the outlook for oil and gas stocks in general? That didn't work, let's try it again, CVE. 
Okay, let's look at a three-year chart of this. So the trend was up for a nice long time. It went parabolic here, which meant it was likely to come back to the trend line, which it did. And then it moved up again, but it failed to make a new high. And so now it has a falling top and it broke down from some falling tops through the upward trend line. That is negative. And so I would be a seller of Synovus. Now, someone at, or the same person is asking about oil and gas stocks in general. So let's take a look at the energy sector on the TSX, apply the same analysis, and you can see that that chart is almost identical. Upward trend line broken from a falling top, it's making a little bounce back this week, but I would look at this as a reason to get out of energy stocks. I wouldn't necessarily sell them wholesale because, you know, let's wait for a second confirming signal, but that's um, not a good looking chart right now. What about VCM, Visama Networks? Okay, I don't know what market that's on, but let's just see here. It must be on Toronto. There it is. So let's look at the three-year chart. So I'll tell you the buy point. Buy point was here, broke out, rising bottom, not normal breakout. Liquidity is not great. The stock doesn't trade very actively. If you're in it, it's good to hold because the buyers are in control. Just like here, the buyers were in control and then they lost control here and it went sideways for over a year. So sell here, buy here and hold currently. So yeah. Let's take a look at, there's lots of questions. I'm, I'm not going to be able to do them all, but um, your thoughts on how Starlink is going to affect the telecommunication sector, BCE, TELUS, Bell. Uh, I have no idea. That's a question for smart people. I only look at what the market tells me. Here's the chart of TELUS. So now you tell me who's in control, buyers or sellers. How do you answer that question? Falling tops or rising bottoms. Okay, the trend is down. So the sellers are in control. Let's take a look at the three-year chart of TELUS. When did the sellers take control? Right here, when you broke down from a falling top, broke the upward trend line. That's kind of what oil did two weeks ago. Ever since then, TELUS has been going lower. So avoid TELUS. How about BCE? T dot BCE. If you want to learn how to do this, I mean, there's a little more to it than what I'm showing you today, but that's what I teach in my courses. So if you want to do it for investing, Take the investor course. If you want to do that for day trading or swing trading, take that course. And again, I'll get into that more this week. Um, BCE broke the upward trend line around the same time, early summer of 2022. It's not as bad because it's actually trying to build a little bit of a rising bottom cycle, but still, I would say it's a stock to avoid. Uh, okay, so I think we'll stop there with the stock questions. I'll just answer one general question here. You mentioned you use TradeStation. How do Canadians access the platform? So you have, if you're a Canadian and you want to use TradeStation, TradeStation is a platform for day traders, for swing traders. Um, it's what I've been using forever. And Canadians are not allowed to open a brokerage account with a U.S. broker. TradeStation is a U.S. broker, but you can subscribe to TradeStation. So just Go to Google and go Trade Station subscription, and that'll take you to the right page, Trade Station Analytics, and there you can subscribe to it on that page. It's 99 US dollars a month. If you want my indicators for Trade Station, which I've developed and spent tens of thousands of dollars building, uh, you have to be an active trader member of Stock Scores. That's what I'll get into next week. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me uh, for this webinar. Hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, I uh, hope you'll join me for some of the others, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week. As always, trade well. And uh, if you have any other questions, please email me. My email address is tylerb at stockscores.com, tylerb at stockscores.com. But uh, again, hopefully you'll be there with me for some of these other webinars uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend, and we'll see you Tuesday.